Hi, welcome to the Leesburg Public Library for today's lecture from David Latassi, The Search for Florida's Paleo Hunters. David Latassi, a paleontologist, has been interested in fossils in prehistoric times since he was eight years old and thus has had 67 years experience searching for fossils all over North America and Asia. By age 12, he had discovered three archaeological sites that are recorded in the Michigan State Archaeological Site Survey. In addition to dinosaurs, Latassi has studied prehistoric man, ancient world history, and archaeology. After serving in the Navy, he decided to travel around the United States to collect specimens from well-known fossil sites in Wyoming, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Florida, as well as Canada and several countries in Asia. After he married his wife, Suzanne, in 1972, she began to travel with him. In 1976, they moved to Florida, where it was possible to collect saber-toothed cat fossils, his main field of interest all year round. After returning to Florida, Latassi worked for the Great Explorations Museum in St. Petersburg and assumed a number of duties, including designing and curating exhibits, and later worked at the Museum of Science and Industry, MOSI, in Tampa. While at MOSI, he led cave explorations for children and adults to the Dames Cave in the Withlacoochee State Forest, as well as fossil collecting trips to mining sites in Polk County. Please enjoy our presentation with David Latassi. Okay, but uh, we came down here in the 1970s and I was always interested in the paleontology and the archeology span of uh, Florida. And um, in that time period, we were very active, what was called the Michigan Archeological Society and the Eastern Federation of Archeologists. And uh, we knew as a fact that some of the earliest artifacts that were being found in North America were from Florida. And my main interest in paleontology are saber-toothed cats. And we find actually more saber-toothed cat fossils here than pretty much anywhere else in North America. Outside of La Brea Tar Pits, you're all probably familiar with that. And they found 2,500 skulls of this La Brea Tar Pit saber cat. But we had this little smaller one that lived here in Florida about two million years ago. And these are the kinds of things that drew Susie and I here to Florida. Not so much her as me, <laughs> but I really like the fossils. And of course, when we were up there uh, in Michigan, the only thing that was really up there that was very easy to find were artifacts from prehistoric people. And at that time, we were finding prehistoric evidence of people that went back at least 10 to 11,000 years ago. And this pursuit of the Florida Paleo Hunters is actually a offshoot of a program that we developed in the 1970s for University of Michigan. And that particular program, we had uh, about 15 academic scholars talking about the first people that entered America. And back in those days, those old time days, um, radiocarbon dates were just starting to come out. Uh, we kind of realized we knew there were enough sites in North America where prehistoric animals like mammoths and mastodons were in direct association with prehistoric people. And so we tried to put that program together and we had a re huge response on it. And some of the paleontologists and archeologists that you're gonna see in this program uh, actually attended that symposium that we put together about 40 years ago. So anyway, uh, let's talk about what we have here in Florida. There's been this really great controversy in North America and when the first people actually came here. And of course, uh, scientists have been kicking this around for nearly 100 years. And so we have really great preservation here of fossils and artifacts. In northern United States, like the Northeast and Central, Western Prairie areas, in the western United States, um, the preservation for bone and wood isn't very good up there because of the conditions of the soil. But here in Florida, we have what are called anaerobic soils. They're very wet. And so there's a really good chance for preservation of bone and wood and other objects here that actually usually disintegrate uh, during the prehistoric time. And this Paleo-Indian period or Paleo-Hunter period, uh, if you're not all familiar with it, uh, generally the archeologists consider that pretty much anything that dates approximately 10,000 years ago and earlier are, are what are considered Paleo-Indians, earliest Native Americans that entered North America. 
And we would like to say exactly when they first came here and give you the first date, but we know kind of when the Ice Age ended, so we say 10,000 years ago. But recently, and I'll discuss this more during the program, new research in Canada has determined that mammoths and horses, prehistoric horses, actually survived as late as 5,000 years ago. So this has actually changed everything. So now we like to say, well, these people were in association, the paleo hunters, with Ice Age megafauna, these large animals like mastodons, large camels, huge bison. Well, actually, these animals actually now we know kind of extended right into the, what's called the Middle Holocene. And that, that's a geological time period, and we're living in the Holocene. You are actually residents of the Holocene period, and it goes back that 10,000 years. But now we know that some of these fossils and animals actually lived only as recently as 5,000 years ago. We know they're extinct, but we used to think they died out just not even a year or two ago. We thought they pretty well terminated or ended around 13,000 years ago. And now everything's changed again. And that's the beauty of science because as we uh, commu accumulate more facts, we find more and more evidence that actually tells us we were a little bit wrong. And so we have to kind of revise our thinking. And that's kind of normal. So uh, we're going to discuss about the geology here in Florida and some of the first people that actually ent entered the field of paleo research. And before we do that, we're going to talk about North America in general uh, during this time period of about 10,000 years ago to about 15, 20, or whatever, thousands of years ago. North America during that time period was called the Pleistocene uh, Animal Age, and it was all the large animals I just described earlier. And at that time, there were vast ice sheets that covered North America. And there were two major ice sheets, one in the east and one in the western North America. And when you look up there north, towards the Pacific coast, uh, near Alaska, you'll see there's this kind of skinny green corridor that runs from Alaska down to the Plains area. Does everybody see that on there? We, we, we don't have a laser pointer, but I'll try to be very descriptive. Now, there's a couple of theories on how people entered North America during this early period. And the, the earliest view was is that people were coming from Asia, Europe and ultimately Asia, out of Africa, and ended up going across what was called the Bering Straits. Now, during the glacial period, the water levels, the ocean levels, dropped about 300 feet lower than they are today. So coastal Florida was about, oh, almost like three times larger than it is today. In fact, if you went over to um, the other side of Citrus County and you got in a boat, charter boat, once you get about 75 miles, miles out, that would be the old coastal area of Florida during the Ice Age. And scientists are now starting to take that area very seriously out there and doing underwater archaeology. So that, that's what it kind of looked like. And they believed that some of these people during the very end of the light Ice Age, uh, Pleistocene period, were coming through that long, skinny corridor down into North America. Some of that's also changing now. That's what we thought like in the 1970s and 80s. Oop, wrong way, wrong way, Corrigan. I ended up in Ireland. <laughs> okay, so the, the first people that they were finding artifacts of, of these Paleo Indians here in North America uh, were these strange points that you see to the left called the Clovis Projectile Point. And these were first found in New Mexico at Blackwater Draw in the 1930s. And the archaeologists at that time were vehement. They were, they were very dogmatic about that people did not live during the Ice Age here in North America, the Indians that were living in the United States and Canada, that they actually came over here only about 4,000 years ago and were kind of related to the, the more modern Eskimos. And that was a view that lasted for about a century here in the United States from around the 1840s right up to 1930s. And then lo and behold, they found these actual projectile points embedded in the bones and next to uh, fossils of mammoths and prehistoric bisons. 
And that really blew the scientific community away. So they were really surprised that there was an association that people did live here during the last ice age. Okay, now this is uh, at the museum in uh, Portales, New Mexico. And my son and I visited this site, uh, I think it was 2019. And we just happened to get into this museum. It was, it was closed up and they were getting ready to move it to a new location. But my son said, oh, my, my dad's an archeologist, please let him come in and look at your collection. And so the director was very accommodating and she let us take some pictures of how they actually had the bones and the artifacts that were in situ, you know, associated together of these Clovis points. So this was actually the first major site. There was another site called Folsom, New Mexico, uh, Folsom. And Folsom actually has artifacts too, but they were not quite as old. And that was found in the late 1920s. But this one kind of sent everybody over the edge. Here in Florida, there were actually people that were also interested in artifacts and fossils from that time period. And here in Florida, fossil collecting from my last program, if you saw my last lecture on Zoom, uh, Florida fossil collecting became very popular in Florida in the 1880s. And a lot of new fossil sites were found. And one of the doctors in uh, Vero, Florida, he actually started collecting fossils along a canal, and he found this human skull associated with prehistoric bones like mammoths and mastodons. And so he's very curious about this, and this was 1915. Now remember, I just told you Clovis was 35, 1935. So this was at least 20 years before they found the association on the Clovis site. So this guy was kind of poo pod at uh, for, for actually even suggesting that people were living here during the Ice Age. And Dr. Ellis Howard Sellards, he was the one that discovered these bones, and he found them in a little drainage canal over in Vero. I don't know if any of you have been on the east coast of Florida at Vero, but Vero is now still being actively worked by archaeologists because over the last 100 years, people have still been finding fossil bones at that site. Uh, they haven't found anything definitive with humans at Vero yet, other than this skull and the partial skeleton, but people are still concerned and really interested in that it's a possibility that this site still could produce prehistoric human remains. So it's actively going on. I read and reviewed about, I think it was a year ago, just before I started developing this program, uh, the, his work and his paper that he wrote. And it was really one of the best scientific papers I've read. So he was really very accurate and he should have been given more credit. But there were people at that time that just did not like the concept of these big prehistoric animals living with people. They really just wanted to stick to that 4,000 year period. <clears throat> the gentleman that actually caused all of this issue, he was uh, Alex Herdleka. He was actually the most prominent archeologist in North America at the time out of the Smithsonian. And he actually destroyed many uh, careers in archeology span because if they wanted to actually express their views other than his, uh, they got into trouble. <laughs> it's not quite that bad right now, but <laughs> that's the way it was about 100 years ago. And so this is, he's the guy that caused this. And then once they've started finding all these bones out west with mammoths and mastodons, and spare points next to it, by 1940, he said, well, gee, I guess they were right. <laughs> so even in his lifetime, he had to kind of admit, yeah, they were wrong. And that's the beauty of archeology span and science, because as we're starting to get more evidence, things are gonna change. We're, we're gonna, we may push this age back many, many thousands of years to actually realize when people really were first here in North America. One of the fossils that was also found uh, in Minnesota was called the Minnesota Man. And you notice they have Minnesota Girl up there. Uh, when they first found her skeleton in the bottom of uh, a glacial lake called Glacial Lake Pelican, and it was found in the 1930s. And of course, her lick has said, ah, it's just a, a, a more of a modern skeleton. But it was under uh, 16,000 years of sediments is almost like 60 feet down 
in the bottom of the lake, and there were like little bars of clay and sand that flooded in that lake every year, and there were 16,000 of these annual layers. So most of the geologists said, well, gee, it may very well be actually 16,000 years old. And so that would have pushed it too far back for Herdlicka. But fortunately, now they've reassessed this skeleton and they've dated it. And it's they dated it radiocarbon at 11,000 years old. It's probably a little earlier than that. And it's actually a girl. She's a 16-year-old girl. Uh, they're, they're trying to uh, use different techniques on that, and I'll discuss that a little bit too. Um, they're working, they did find some uh, taper fossils at Faro, and so those fossils are uh, convincing them that there are really associations of things at that sequence, you know, that layer. Because a lot of that, the problem with Faro was it was very highly disturbed. And so as I go through the program, I'm going to explain to you a couple of areas in the, the radiocarbon dating and the new dating systems, that there are problems with it, but little by little, I think we'll sort some of that stuff out, okay? So she was on the list of the early ones. And then along came a guy by the name of Bill Royal in the 1950s. And Bill Royal is really quite famous here in Florida. He was actually a diver for the US military in the World War II. And when he uh, left the service, he actually kept his scuba gear. And he moved here to Florida. And he decided to get his scuba gear out and start exploring some of the sinkholes and caves here in Florida. And he came, went down to Warm Mineral Springs near Sarasota. Anybody ever been down there? And, got your tootsies in the water, and <laughs> you did it knock any years off your life. <laughs> it's supposed to rejuvenate people. So anyway, uh, Bill was actually diving in the bottom of this spring head, and when he went down the side of the ledge on the rock there, you can see there's like a little black area kind of in the middle of the rock layer, and the cone of sediments on the bottom. And then that little cave area that was to the side as he was diving down, he looked in the cracks and crevices in there and he actually saw some stalactites and stalagmites like this. And right behind him was a human skull. And so he thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And he couldn't retrieve it when he first went down there because of the stalactites and stalagmites. And so he brought a saw down, and I've got one of his stalagmites that he cut off for that, that warm mineral spring. But he cut it off, and he could reach back there, see, and pick the skull up. And then as he was swimming to the surface, to the top of the pond, he was noticing the skull in the back of the skull, where the opening where your spinal cord goes into it, uh, some kind of stuff that looked like licks, liquid, liquid soap was oozing out of the back of it. And he kind of thought, gee, that's pretty strange. So he took it up to Gainesville, University of Florida. And uh, the scientists up there at that time, they said, gee, you have human brain tissue. And then they actually found with this uh, site, a giant tortoise, you know, they were like longer than this table, these giant tortoise. And if you've ever been up to the University of Florida, uh, Florida Museum of Natural History, it's not far from here. It's just up in Gainesville. I don't think it's even an hour from here. And they have one of these giant tortoises on display up there. But it's really cool. Great museum. You got to see it. And um, so he realized that this was an Ice Age site because they were finding tortoise. And then another fellow in the 1970s, Sonny Cockrell, uh, went to the same site. And he found even saber cat bones, like the saber tooth cat. So this was actually an Ice Age site, and they finally dated it. And it does go back between 10 to 12, 10 to 11,000 years. And I told you, you know, they were saying for a long time uh, in the 1990s um, that we only, these things became extinct 13,000 years ago. But at, now we know they were later. So a date that goes like 10,000 years ago with extinct megafauna, like saber cats, is not unreasonable. There's a good possibility that they lived here in Florida that recently. So Bill was really became pretty famous over this site. And the reason that the brain tissue, anybody have an idea why brain tissue would survive underwater like that for 10,000 years? Well, the water down there is called anaerobic water. Uh, there's no bacteria in it. And so it's a perfect medium so that if a 
tissue is encapsulated like in a skull and nothing can get to it, then obviously the, uh, the, the brains could preserve. And there's another site I'll be talking about too, it's called Wendover, uh, that has brain tissues in the bodies. But the interesting thing about this site too is that uh, for them to actually put a body in that little cave on the side, about 80 feet down, you know, people couldn't hold their breath and put a body down there and bury it. It just, that just doesn't work, you know. So obviously the water table was much lower. And when the water table was lower in that cave, that was during the Ice Age. That was, and we do know that the water level here in the Gulf of Mexico was much lower even up to 8,000 years ago. So there were even sites only as recently as, recently as old as 8,000 years ago. So this is kind of evidence that keeps adding up here in Florida. And because of our preservation here, I think we're going to be the central area of the country to determine when, when people really came into North America. And that's the saber that Sonny Cockrell found in Warm Mineral Springs. They're pretty rare. I have a, a fossil saber tooth cat's uh, tooth saber that I found in... Um, uh, near St. Pete Beach, not too, about 40 years ago when I first came down here fossil collecting. And it's pretty rare. You might want to look at it. In the University of Florida, uh, they have three examples of these sabers and mine, and those are the only four that are known in Florida. So they're pretty rare. This little saber cat that's earlier, uh, we have dozens of those sabers, but not the larger saber cat. Also, in the 1980s, a fellow by the name of Ripley Boland started working on the different artifacts that they found here in Florida. And Ripley was actually analyzing all the different Paleo-Indian artifacts. And he started naming the various artifacts based on the counties and who discovered them here in Florida. And so Ripley was very prominent here in Florida and determining what early people were living here in Florida by the 1980s. And he was pretty convinced that many of the early artifacts that looked very similar to the Clovis points were associated with prehistoric animals here in Florida. And he was kind of the pioneer that put it together here in Florida. And my favorite guy, I know, I've know i known uh, James Dunbar for quite a number of years. I met him in the 1980s. And Jim is probably one of the most prominent ar archeologists here in the state of Florida. And he's been working numerous sites, especially in the Santa Fe River and the Acela River. And we were just discussing that gentleman, with that gentleman earlier about the Acela River project. And uh, that's probably one of the largest archeological projects in the state of Florida. And uh, they were doing that project basically in the 1990s, early 2000s, about 20, 25 years ago. And almost all of the most prominent archeologists in Florida in the Southeastern United States today actually worked on the uh, the Scylla River project. I was doing other things at the time, but uh, a fellow, a good friend of mine was working on it and, and Dr. Dunbar. And Dr. Dunbar actually became the state archeologist in the eight, uh, 1990s. Got to be careful, 1880s, no. <laughs> 1980s, 1990s. And uh, I, when I first met him, we were at a, an archeological conference and an archeology span show, show in um, Plant, Plant City, near Plant City. And uh, it was a big show with artifacts. <clears throat> and we heard about a fellow down here near Plant City that had a very large Indian artifact collection. And so a friend of mine and Jim, and we call him Jim, James Dunbar, and uh, we got in the back of a van, and the three of us were sitting in the back of a van, you know, kibitzing about the artifacts that we find here in Florida. And uh, the one guy was quite a diver, and he was uh, talking about the artifacts in the Santa Fe River, in the Suwannee River. And not much work had been done on those artifacts for, for decades here in Florida. And we told Jim, we said, Jim, you know, when we go down in the rivers, and you see these bone points. In fact, I've got one here somewhere. Ah, here it is. We find literally thousands of these fossil bone artifacts that are like a pin or a long needle. Susie, pass that around. Let everybody take a look at this. 
<clears throat> and these are fossilized. You know, let, listen. Oh, I just broke it. I just broke it. Here, you can look at two pieces. We got, we've got glue. I can get away with that. <laughs> it was, it wasn't quite as hard as I thought, but it is fossilized bone. And uh, we also find these. Susie passed this too. Susie, okay. <laughs> But anyway, we were telling Jim, we said, you know, if you go down in the river, you see these bones, needles <clears throat> sticking out of the sediments <clears throat> and the clay and the sand <clears throat> with animal bone, like mastodon bone. And when you look at the bone pins, the, the part of it that's sticking out of the water is really deteriorated and then kind of rough looking. But then when you dig it out of the bank, the bone looks like brand new with tool marks on it. So we told him, we said, Jim, these are stratified sites. These sites go back in the Ice Age, and they're real sites, you know, and you should be able to date them underwater. And back then, no one really believed in underwater archaeology. All the archaeologists in the 1980s says, bah, humbug. <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, we're not going to be interested in that. But Jim persevered, and he went into the Santa Fe River, and he collected artifacts. And he verified exactly what myself and this other fellow were saying, that these are stratified sites here in Florida that went back to the Ice Age. And the guy that actually started this whole concept in the rivers was a fellow by the name of Ben Waller. And Ben was a very noted diver in Ocala, which isn't far from here, just up the road. And Ben was collecting, and he's one of these military guys from World War II, took his scuba gear home, thought he'd go in the rivers in northern Florida and see what's there. And sure enough, he was finding artifacts and arrowheads and fossil bones. And he, really, he actually found a bone of a bird that was six feet tall, and they named it Titanus walleri, walleri after Ben. And uh, the University of Florida really got interested in it. And so uh, Ben showed them where all of these sites were in the Santa Fe River and the Suwannee River. And now we've actually have dozens of sites that have been recorded here in Florida. Rel thank thankfully for Ben Waller. I had the, actually had the honor to um, know Ben Waller. And the last time I saw him before he passed, uh, he actually attended one of my lectures on saber tooth cats. So I was very pleased that I was able to do a lecture for him. And uh, this little cave here, I've worked in for quite a number of years in a kind of rather strange way. Uh, when I worked at the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa, I would actually lead expeditions and do cave exploration here in Florida as a teaching exercise. And we would take adults and kids and everybody else into the cave systems and let them explore. And this Dame Caves was actually, Dame's Cave is in the south end of Citrus County, so it's not too far from here. And they found actually some paleo tools. Susie, would you pick up that um, Acilla ads? That's the one closest to me, that one. She's getting to know this stuff as good as I am. One of these days, I'm going to let her do this program. <laughs> and so, and so, she, so uh, one of these ads, these paleo Indian ads and paleo artifacts were found in Dame's Cave. So the thing is that here in Florida, we find these early people's artifacts and bones in caves, sinkholes, underground caverns on the bottoms of rivers. So there's a number of places we find these and it's because the preservation is so good. And one of my students, it wasn't one of these kids, but one of them was actually crawling in the bottom of this cave and something sharp hit him on his knee. And he looked down with his flashlight and sure enough, it was a bowling point. It was a a, a, late, a very late paleo Indian artifact and he brought it up to the surface and he said Mr. Dave <laughs> what is this and I said well you actually found a prehistoric artifact and he, he was really so excited but unfortunately this is state land and so we, we actually cannot legally collect artifacts on state land it's against the law and rivers so I told the little guy I said sorry you got to take it back put it right where you found it but we did the honor system. I didn't double check on them. So I don't know if it ended up at home or back in the cave. <laughs> so if you go down there, maybe you'll find it too. I don't know. But this was a very good spot here in Florida. And the reason we think that the Paleo Indians at that time who were using this cave is uh, our, our 
rocks here in Florida are limestone. This is a piece of limestone. And we find fossils in it, but there's some harder material in this soft limestone called chert. And chert and silica, it's a, it's a natural form of rock called silica. Uh, and it's an element that's very glass-like. And when it forms in the limestone uh, from the different animals, it kind of take that silicone into their body, silica, and then they die and then it becomes part of the lime rock. And that's why we find so many fossils. And the prehistoric people were going into these caves and they were actually looking for that hard rock and they would chip and make artifacts out of it. In fact, uh, your paleo scraper probably came from, could have very well came from Dame's Cave Church. That's where they were looking for the material. Now we believe that a lot of these people are living way out on the coastal area, 75 miles out to the Gulf now, because it was a, bro a broad coastal plain with grasslands, just ideal for mastodons and um, giant bison, because bisons are, you know, grazers, so that would have been perfect camels. In fact, a lot of the fossils we find here in North America, people were eating horses and camels. Uh, the one case I have over there's actually a camel tooth that was carved by prehistoric people, Ice Age camel. So when you come up here after the program, you can check this limestone. That's our rock layers that we have under the clay and sands here. If we dug under this building and went deep enough, you would find this limestone. It's part of what's called the Ocala Formation. I did a, a lecture, the, the lecture I just gave you last in October, and I really laughed. They encapsulated parts of the lecture, and they called it the uh, Ocali formation and they spelled it like A-U-C-K-I-L-L-E. <laughs> and, and it was like, okay, it's Ocala from like Ocala, Florida. And uh, they messed that up. So I, I'd like to go in there and kind of change that. But, you know, it's once it's on the internet, you're in trouble, you know. <laughs> so anyway, here's that Ocilla ads that we just passed around. That, that one there came from a site uh, that we've had a lot of artifacts from. And some of them are up here. It's called the Norden site. And it's the same kind of artifact that was found in Dame's Cave. And the fellow that started this whole Oscilla River project that I just mentioned, uh, a couple of amateur archaeologists were actually diving in the Oscilla River. And they started finding a lot of bone with artifacts. And so they brought it to the attention of uh, the archaeologists up in the University of Florida. And Dave Webb, he's a... Uh, was the prominent number one paleontologist at the University of Florida from the 1960s all the way up until when he retired. I think it was 2010 or something like that he retired. And then he passed about a year and a half ago. Uh, but Dave actually, the reason we have the Florida Museum of Natural History and this wonderful collection uh, is because of Dave Webb. He was just a prominent paleontologist and a very good friend. We did a lot of projects together over the years. And so Dave started surveying all of this material in the Asilla River, and uh, they came up with some spectacular dates and some of the artifacts, and especially the fossil bone that they were finding. Uh, one is called the Sloth Hole site on the Asilla River, and it has really good bone preservation with Paleo-Indian artifacts. So when did these first people come into North America? What was the question? Um, the Wasissa Mastodon was found in uh, the Wasissa portion of the Asilla River, and it's a side branch of the Asilla. And this was found in, in the in 1980s, 90s, when they were doing this project, and it's actually a skull cap of an extinct bison. And on the very top of that skull cap is a, a piece of a projectile point. One of these paleo artifacts, like the spear point, like the Clovis point, was thrown with the spear and it hit the head of this bison, stuck in it, broke off, and all that's left was a little tip of that chert or flint in the, in the top of that skull. And then they x-rayed it, and you can see the x-ray on the right, and they know that this was radiocarbon dated at 10,000 plus years ago. So it's another example of that time period of the Ice Age people living here in Florida. And this was an extinct species of uh, bison called bison antiquus. Uh, thanks to Dave, Dave did the work on it. And then at the Page Ladson portion of the Asilla River, the two amateur archeologists were Page and Ladson. So they named the 
site after Page and Ladson, and they found this Macedon tusk. And the interesting thing about the Macedon tusk is that you can see the black arrow is actually where the tusk meets the top of the skull, where it was stuck into the jaw. And then the blue arrow is actually some scratch marks or cut marks. And so they took one of these large paleo scrapers and they were trying to break the skull apart to get the tusk out. Now, we're not sure that they were trying to use the tusk for ivory because we do find artifacts in the rivers <clears throat> actually made of our fossil ivory. So they were using some ivory for artifacts. But the other reason that they may have actually broken up this tusk to get to the inside of it is there's a large marrow capsule inside the tooth. And so that would have been really delicious cuisine. <laughs> Something to eat for dinner. Of course, when you've butchered a mammoth or a mastodon, there's a lot of steaks and stew meat and that. There's a possibility, and I probably shouldn't say this, but they may have found a, a mastodon that was like um, not in the most rosiest condition, killed by a predator, and they may have actually scavenged off of it as well. So there's a possibility that if you broke into the marrow capsule, that would have been a little fresher than what was on the surface, you know. Now, a lot of animals like bears and wolves, they can eat carrion. So that, so that may have what have happened. But it's still evidence that people were trying to dis break, break apart and dismember the skull. And so that's definite interaction with people. But the spectacular thing is that this actual tusk dated to 14,550 years ago. And the Clovis points have been dated all over North America between 13,200 years and 12,700 years. So it has to be pre-Clovis. And a lot of the archeologists just don't like that. They don't, they don't like somebody saying it's older than their pet Clovis points. Oh, well. It just happens in archaeology. So, so this right here in Florida, we have direct evidence that there were people here at least a few thousand years or a thousand years before the Clovis people. So Clovis' first theory, everybody wanted to say in the 80s and 90s, Clovis was the first technology people in North America. Well, we're finding evidence of people a little earlier than that. And here's one of the artifacts that was found at the Page, Page Ladson site. And you can kind of see how they were excavating up there to the site where it was found in the unit level with the, uh, with the tusk. So th this is the kind of evidence, this is really suggesting that people were at least coming into Florida 15,000 years ago, easily. And some of the Page Ladson points are to the left there on the upper left of the drawings. And you can actually, in this case over here, as you come up, the Norden site that, that we have here in our collections are two of these Page Ladson points. So this site here from the Norden site in Santa Fe River should date to at least 14,000 years ago. It's, it's actually other, other artifacts at the Norden site that are a little late, more recent, but even the oldest component of that site or part of that site goes back at least 14,000 years. So that's one of the sites here in Florida too, that predates the Clovis and Silver Springs. And Silver Springs, has anybody been over here to Silver Springs near Ocala? Beautiful park, they have a beautiful nature center there. And they really have a nice uh, fossil exhibit, Ice Age fossil exhibit, if you ever get over there. But the Silver River Macedon, was excavated in the 1930s and 40s. And they actually found what are called Simpson points, artifacts that look like the Clovis point, but doesn't have that long, narrow channel on the bottom of it. And so a lot of paleontologists and archeologists believe that Silver Spring is actually a very important site here in Florida that would have the association of some of these artifacts with prehistoric people and could very well go back before the Clovis technology. technology. The earliest mastodons were found quite early here in North America. In fact, some of the earliest mastodon excavations was in uh, New York 
in 1799. And ranch, ranchers and farmers were finding when they were plowing their fields or digging uh, re, uh, you know, like little retention ponds for water, they run into these skeletons. And even in Virginia, uh, our first paleontologist, anybody know who our first paleontologist is? Oh, you all know who he is. Thomas Jefferson, very good, that's right. And Tommy found some <laughs> fossil bones of mammoth here in Virginia and uh, he noticed that was interesting and he didn't know really it for sure what they were. And he had some uh, fellows that worked on his hacienda, <laughs> you know, and uh, they were actually from Africa, as you well know. And uh, he showed those bones to the, his uh, folks <laughs> and they said, well, those are elephants, you know, that's elephant animal. So he realized there was some form of a prehistoric elephant lived here in North America. And then one mammoth is named after from Mammothus, Mammothus Jeffersoni. And so he was very concerned uh, that you would find mammoth bones here in, Florida, in uh, North America. But at that time, in the early 1800s, the scientists did not believe in extinction. They thought every animal that ever lived is still living today. There was no such thing as extinction. And so he went so far as to say that the mammoth is probably still living somewhere out west. And uh, his two best, one of his best friends was uh, uh, Clark from the Rogers and Clark, Lewis and Clark expedition. And uh, in fact, one of our best friends is related to Clark and, uh, and worked on one of the sites I'm gonna be talking about here. And so he was so convinced that mammoths were still alive out in the Western prairies when during the expedition in 1804, he trained Clark to be a taxidermist <laughs> so he could bring back a, a mammoth, <laughs> taxidermy mammoth. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? A taxidermy mammoth. We actually got better today. You probably know that. Frozen mammoths. This is a Macedon bone that was actually found in uh, Washington State, and it dates to 13,800 years old, and it has actually one of these bone points tip stuck right in the and we have a rib over here with cut marks on it mastodon and it would have been stuck right into the top of that rib and so this is the kind of evidence we look for for looking for what's called bone modification so that's really important and you can see from the position on the skeleton the way the bone was stuck into the backbone it, the angle of it was like right towards the top of the back so this kind of would have been the exact spot, like if a Native American threw a spear and it landed on the elephant, it would have hit perfect in that angle. So the scientists are arguing over this. They, some, one, one paleontologist says, well, we think it was actually another Macedon uh, gored it with its tusk and it broke off. But, the, but this is actually cellular bone, the point it's not dentine of a tusk. So that theory is kind of like doesn't hold water. But this is one of the early evidence of people here interacting. In fact, one of our friends in uh, St. Augustine, he has a hip bone of a Macedon and it has a projectile point stuck in it, one of these bone points. He hasn't published yet. I've been trying to get him to publish it. And um, he said, boy, what a deal this poor mammoth had. It was old. It was sick from the disease in its bones. And then it got stuck in the rear end by a Native American. <laughs> Life out in the wilderness, right? Back then, your backyard was your Walmart. <laughs> you found whatever you could find. Now, here's a, the CAT scan of the bone. And it's that long, kind of white, lighter colored angle bone that went through all this other mess that you see there on the upper right is actually debris of the bone as it was pushed aside by the projectile. And the x-ray on the very bottom there, you can kind of see the actual shape of the projectile, how it went into the bone. So this is a, a really important technology that archaeologists are using today is we're studying how bones are cut up and broken especially with the artifacts like these spear points. And this is how we believe some of these bone points were actually hafted by these prehistoric people. And it was a very interesting technique. 
uh, these little four shafts of bone could have been e used either for to hold a big blade like a Clovis point, or it could have been used itself as a projectile point. I think they were mostly projectile points myself, and I think a lot of these large blades that you see are actually knives that they were butchering with the knives. They could have actually used one on a spear, but it was probably a multi-purpose kind of thing with these large spear points. But this was used with an atlatl, a spear thrower. I don't know if you're familiar with the spear thrower, but it's a piece of wood with a hook on the end, and then your shaft of your spear hooks onto the end of that shaft with the point on it. And then when you throw it, you just hold on to the spear throw and let the spear go. And that extends the leverage of your arm. And you can actually throw a spear about four or five times further than you could by just using your hand. It was a very lethal weapon. It could go through a tree trunk. So it's, it, it would be perfect for ice age hunting. And this is what the megafauna looked like across the Bering Straits. And this is where Many of these megafaunas were starting to come in for, into North America. So we have what are called interstate highways of land bridges from South America, North America, through Asia. And these animals migrated, and people, of course, were following these migrations. And some of the animals were ferocious, like giant bears and lions. There were huge lions here in North America. So the first people that entered North America were challenged by some of these large predators. But when you have fire and you have an atlatl and a spear, you can pretty well fend yourself. And out here in Florida, as I said earlier, uh, we're looking at this coastal area of Florida. You can see the black dark line to the left. That would have been the kind of the old shoreline during the ice age. But if you can see the lighter pattern, that was actually probably the very edge of Florida at the very peak of the ice age, about 18,000 years ago. The maximum of the ice as it flowed, moved, and migrated southward North America, its southern extent was the Ohio River Basin. So it only stretched so far south. And we had twice the length, size of the land here, so it was very likely that most of the people were living out in that broad prairie and coastal area. They came into central Florida around this area, especially during drought, <clears throat> or if they were running out of chert and flint, because we had the sinkholes here, and they would have came in the sinkholes and looked for this chert. One of the most famous sites found in North America in the 1970s was Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. And the fellow, James Adavazio, was one of our lecturers by one of our early programs, and James came to me and he said, Dave, I had the most terrible thing happen to our school. What happened? They, they donated us a million dollars to do a project on research on archaeology. I said, oh, poor you. And so, so he put together a field school and they needed a cave to work on to you know, have the students learn how to do archaeological research and excavating. And they dug down about 20 feet in this cave, and lo and behold, they actually found artifacts that went back 16,000 years ago. And so this was just a fluke. I mean, it was just like a field school. You know, let's see what we get. And now it's like one of the most famous early sites in North America. So Dr. Adebasio got really lucky. <clears throat> On the coast of eastern North America, Near the Chesapeake Bay, we find a large number of these early points. And some of these points are very similar to the Page Ladson points that I showed you from the Osceola River. And some of these sites here along the Maryland and Virginia coast have been excavated, and they've been getting dates of 14, 15, 18, 21, and right up to this last one that are now considered Salutrian points. And these points are found in France. So a fellow by the name of Dennis Stanford came up with the idea that there's a possibility that people were actually coming from Europe, from northern Spain and southwestern France across the ice sheet. They may have actually either walked across the ice sheet 
or they may have used a, a boat like a raft. We're not sure. It's very controversial. It's called the Salutrian theory, and a lot of people are fighting that tooth and nail. They don't, they don't like that idea. But we do know that people from Indonesia were migrating into Australia 40,000 years ago, and the only way they could get there was by boat. And one of the new technologies that they're using to identify these early sites is called optical stimulated luminescence. And they're actually taking the sand particles and stimulating with lasers. And they can now date the sand in these deposits as well as they can with carbon-14. So we are getting some significantly early dates with this new technology. <clears throat> One of the points that was just brought to me uh, within the last year was this little black artifact in the, their hand, and it's a cactus hill point. And in Virginia, there's a very famous, famous site where they've actually been excavating artifacts that are at least 15 to 16,000 years old at Cactus Hill. And this little gal found a, a point right on the Pax River, Maryland. <clears throat> and this point, <clears throat> I identified it, and it's definitely a Cactus Hill point. So all the archaeologists are really excited about this. And the little gal that found it is Dawn. She found that a couple of years ago. And now the, the archaeologists in Maryland are going to start studying this point. So people we know were living here during the Ice Age, and they had technologies that were very advanced. People don't like the idea that people are advanced, but we do know that they were using wood, fabrics, all kinds of materials and the site called Wendover site near Kissimmee, Florida, actually had produced burials that were 8,000 years old with textiles, brain tissue, wood artifacts, bone artifacts. And it's very likely those people were using the same kind of technology they were using during the late Ice Age. And absolutely, it's possible that these people were hunting like giant extinct animals, even up to 8,000 years ago, because the evidence we're finding in Canada that dates it even uh, more recently. And one of the gals that's studying a lot of this work with the bone modification in these dates is Jessie Harrigan. She just sent, sent me a paper recently to review. I haven't had time to do it yet, but I'll see what she wrote. She's very prominent in archaeology. So that's the, the Salutrian hypothesis. And they were using these kind of blades and the other ones I showed in the other picture. And those are found around the Chesapeake Bay area. So this is a picture of Dennis Stanford. He passed a couple years ago. And uh, he actually found artifacts that are paleo. And you notice the big ad scraper there to sort of to the upper middle. Does that look familiar? <laughs> I told you that you got that's what you got. And Dennis would probably go nuts over there. Oh my gosh, look what you got. <laughs> and then they find bone fragments, and these are bone fragments and tools are found in North America and Europe, and they look exactly the same. So the bone pin that I passed around, they were using these in France about 18,000 years ago. Here's one that's found in Ohio. And here's how they were possibly Adelaide points where they put on the end of Adelaide. I think they were used for a lot of different things. Some of the short ones were probably composite fish hooks for spearing. Some of them were just like for Adelaide spear point. They, they could have also used them for flaking their tools, the flint tools. You could use it as a percussion tool. And so these are some of the large tools from Western France that look identical to the ones we're finding here in uh, Eastern United States. So that's what Dennis came up with, this Salotrian hypothesis, that there was a corridor coming in uh, from, from, North, from Europe, Western Europe, along the Atlantic Sea coast down into Florida. And at the same time or earlier, there were people coming in the Purple Arrow uh, from, the, from Asia. So it's a very likelihood that people are coming from more than one direction. Uh, some of the DNA that turned up at Wendover in Kissimmee, that's 8,000 years old, actually had a DNA that archaeologists refused to acknowledge. And it was very similar to Western humans, Caucasians. They didn't like that. P 
politics, I guess. <laughs> Florida, no, not really. That's a disclaimer, no. Uh, Simpson points, these are found very frequently here in Florida. And it's probably one of my favorite points. Found some of these myself. We find a, a number of points in various concentrations here in Florida. And so this map, you'll see, we are in what is called paleocentral of Florida. <laughs> the, almost all of the major paleontology sites with archaeology sites with paleo-Indian artifacts is in west central Florida. It goes from about St. Petersburg on up to Tallahassee. And about 90% of the artifacts are in heavy concentrations around the Santa Fe River, Suwannee River. Uh, this area here has a high concentration. Uh, you can see the black splotchy areas. And then there's some just east of uh, Tampa called the uh, Harney Flats site. And then the Norton site, and this is our site that's up here. When you cup, you, you can take a look at this case and you can see these artifacts. Uh, from the Norton site in the Santa Fe River. And the two points in the center are the uh, uh, Page Ladson points that probably date around 14,000 or more. So the Ansig burial that was out in uh, Colorado and it had a burial and it was a Clovis burial and it dated 12.5, but it had blood on the tools. And so the blood to, was actually DNA. They were able to, it was human blood, and they were able to do a DNA profile on this individual, and they actually came from Asia. So they were reinterred with the Native Americans. We have a policy even here in Florida that if you find human remains, we turn them into the Florida Public Archaeology Network, and they're actually reinterred with the Native tribes of Florida. So they're reburied. So if you find human remains, it is a $10,000 fine if you keep or dig in a burial or something like that. Uh, and even people come up to me and say, Dave, what's this? And it's human bone. I said, I'll give you 20 days to turn it into the state. You just have to turn it in. I could get arrested too for not saying it. There's another one of those bone points. This is Sheridan Cave, Ohio. And let's see, broken bone. And we have a piece of that. Pass that bone around, honey. Susie's honey. <laughs> Don't y'all girls all get up now at once. No, no, the other one. That's it. Now, there's two pieces of white piece of arrows on that bone. You can let them pass it around if you want to. But there's what, there's a, they were taking stone tools, like a boulder, and they were smashing these bones open to make tools and get the marrow out. Yeah, see the two white things? Yeah. Yeah. Those are the cones of percussions on this bone. And this came from the Norden site, and it's actually the humerus of an Ice Age horse. And so they were actually smashing these bones up for the marrow. In fact, you could take uh, bones from mammoths and mastodons, and you could make soup out of them. You just take the bone and put it in a depression with some something on it to keep the water from running out, heat it with hot stones, and make kind of a broth out of it. So it would kind of be a stopgap for starvation by eating these uh, m marrow out of the bones and highly nutritious, the marrow. I love marrow in a bone. You ever eat marrow out of a bone? Yep. France, I think they have a delicacy on that marrow. Okay. And here's some of the tools that they look like that they would have made. A lot of wood handles and bone handles. And the blue area is the phosphate district and the red in the bottom of Florida. And this is where all the sinkholes occur with phosphate deposits. And this is where the chert deposits were that people would actually come up during certain periods of the time in the year and actually look for cherts. And because a lot of these sinkholes had freshwater springs, uh, the animals would congregate at these sites. And I, I've been, I think I surveyed three macedons from spring heads here in Florida. And I told a guy, Richard Halbert at the University of Florida, I said, I believe there's a Macedon in every springhead in Florida. <laughs> Don't know if they were all killed by Native Americans, but. So the preservation is perfect here because of the water. And the concentrations are right in our neighborhoods. And the Simpson points, these are some of the artifacts that we find frequently here. And these Simpson points are found like at the Haney uh, site up in uh, Tampa. 
And of course, we find interaction of elephants at these sites. In Pinellas County, there are the little black dots. There are literally dozens of artifacts found in Pinellas County, one of the areas I collected in the 1970s. There's some of the artifacts from Pinellas County. So that was a heavy concentration. And the one site that we did uh, uh, identify and recognize as a late Ice Age site was called the Millennium Park. And a little girl found a mammoth tooth there, and they brought me into this site to identify what it, whether it was a site or not. And they said, the bones are in the storage shed where we have our tractors. And all the tractors were sitting outside. And so it's near St. Pete, near Boca Siga Bay. And I went into that shed, and the whole shed, the entire floor of the shed was covered with bone. And I said, oh my God, you got an Ice Age site. It's a, you know, it's a huge, massive, it was almost gray of tar pits. And so I saw bison remains there, and right away I knew, late Ice Age, about, they're dating it at the University of Florida, about 14 to 20,000 years old. And one of the camel bones has some cut marks on it. So the, probably more research will be taking place there. There's our saber cat, saber tooth. And this skull of a saber cat was found in Marion Sink. It's not far from here. A uh, local amateur paleontologist collected this out of the sinkhole. And it has a hole in the back of the skull. And some of the archaeologists are claiming that this may be a spear point stuck through that skull. And that skull actually dates to 20,000 years old. And this site here, Paisley Cave, is like one of my favorite sites in Oregon. And they found a really wonderful human remains in that cave called doo-doo, poop, human waste. And they were able to run a DNA sample, and they proved that this cave was 14,000 years old on the Oregon coast. So some of these people were probably coming right along the coast. And Wakula Springs, this is going to be the one that's going to tell it all. Uh, Dr. Dunbar has been working on this site in Wakula Springs, and he found a concentration of artifacts over a meter below the surface, and it had an actual Simpson point associated with it, and mastodon remains have been found in that exact deposit. And one of the layers that's just above it is a little layer of what is called platinum dust. And there was an actual meteoric event 13,000 years ago where meteor hit the earth and created all this dust and it's been created a, an actual dating possible date layer to 13,000 years old and Dunbar is saying definitely that that's a 13,000 year old horizon and he found Simpson points just at or below a few inches below that deposit so he's thinking that it's probably pre-Clovis. It may very well be pre-Clovis or maybe associated with Clovis. They're just not fluted points. <clears throat> Don Hen Dr. Andy Hemmings has been working at Wendover and he did a lot of the work on the Asilla River project. In uh, Wakula Spring Lithics, there's one of those big tool-like blades that you see that's so common in that they love those big artifacts. They were using them to break up mammoth bones, and they were butchering large chunks of meat. And then they could chip them and make a scraper out of them, or they could break them down and make an artifact or a projectile point. So these were like, you carried these around in a bag with you, you know, and that was like your main tool. I like them better than some of the points. OK, and there's one of the artifact sites, the topper site. Uh, that's in the Carolinas. Al Goodyear's working that. He's got a Clovis layer there that's 13,000 years old, and he's finding artifacts below the Clovis level. And bone cut marks, there's a cave, bluefish cave up in Alaska. I did, when I did a program in the 1970s, one of the guys, Irvin, Will, oh, Irvin Williams, uh, he actually did one of the archeology span work in uh, Alaska and Yukon, and was finding bone in the caves near Old Crow, where we're finding artifacts that were carved by people 27,000 years old. So there's a good likelihood people are coming across that corridor at least 27,000 years ago. And the real test to all of this is the Saruti Mastodon. 
and it's been dated and not by radiocarbon dating. It's too early. Potassium argon dating, 130,000 years old. And it's found in near Los Angeles, San Diego, by San Diego. And it was found in a road cut next to expressway expansion. And they've been working on this Macedon. And they say that it has human interaction where the bones were intentionally broken for the marrow or other things. And it has all the fracturing evidence that you would see that we see here in Florida of this paleo bone. And so the question is, 130,000 years ago, and they're saying that it was 80 or 90,000 years ago that Homo sapiens left Africa. So who were the people here 130,000 years ago? Neanderthals, Denisovians, uh, you know, they're, they're way earlier than humans. So, but Danny Fisher has been working on this site, and I've known Danny for decades. And Danny and I were working in the 1980s, and uh, he found Macedon footprints in the lake, and plus the caches where they were taking this bone from Macedon and putting them under the water under a blanket with rocks over it so they wouldn't come to the surface. And then they could go there and they could take that meat out over the year, even up till the summer. He put a bison carcass under the water the same way and killed it in the fall, and he had fresh steaks all the way up to June the next year. So he believes that's what they were doing on these sites, and, and he's convinced that uh, Saruti Macedon was something like that. But the question is, man, you know, who were these people? And he's working on a mammoth there in uh, Michigan, too, that dates over 15,000 years old. So... The, the tell of a, this whole thing was, were there people here before the Clovis culture? And just recently, and I mean, this is really recently, that in New Mexico, the archaeologists in New Mexico found a layer of volcanic ash that has been known to be dated at 20,000 years old for decades, and it produced human footprints. So the concept of Clovis first is going to be really hard sell for people. And if you have any questions on any of this material, feel free to email me, check out some of the literature that's out there. And there's tons and tons of YouTube videos on this subject. Thank you.